There are several things that are odd about this process. First, that in order to get to it, in order to arrive at this point, there had to be a 937-page study done so that you could vote on closing the airport. <laughs> and the process required that alternatives be submitted. And one of the alternatives was designing a mixed-use walkable town. And that's the one that won. So very unusually and somewhat embarrassingly, we actually have a project already. You know, because it had to be done to get to this place. And I'll show it to you today. Uh, of course, it has a long way to go, but it had to be pretty precise. You, you, had to make that, you had to make that judgment whether to go keep the airport or go with this. So this is unusual, but uh, please believe me that it is modifiable. It's as good as we knew how to make it, but it was not done with consultation. So even though you see it today, we can still modify it. And I'll get back to that. Now, what happened today was that 35 people came in and they were in almost perfect agreement on everything, which you saw presented today by Gary. That is very unusual. It's also slightly suspect because no one is ever in perfect agreement. And in fact, there are people sending me emails saying that they're in fundamental disagreement with the first premises of everything we're doing here. So what occurred today is that there was a self-selected group that was exceedingly positive towards this project. And we painted a utopia. And that utopia was really beautiful and quite reasonable. You didn't ask for the moon. And we know how to deliver it. Okay, so I think we can all agree that things look good. What we need to, what you need to help me with is what can go wrong. Okay, what can go wrong? What is the, this thing that is moving beautifully forward? And I'll give you some details about this that kept me here, you know, because I, I have such great hopes for this project. This is moving beautifully forward, but things, things happen in this country. Great things fail to happen. Logical things fail to happen. And we need to sort of, you know, get on with that as well. And I'm going to tell you an anecdote from my, fa from my father, who was a developer, who I'll never forget. He says, as long as the fists of your opponents are in front of you, you can protect yourself. What always gets you is the third fist, <laughs> you know, the one that you don't know. And the exercise he always did is he always wanted to analyze what all the possible fists were, because the minute you identify a fist, it's in front of you and you can deal with it. So if we don't deal with things that can go wrong, they can get us. And these projects are complex. They're very long range projects. Many things can discombobulate them. And I think that as we speak today, we should actually have that realism that, that knows that actually excellence is not the default setting in America. Mediocrity is, particularly in urban planning. The completion of a project is unusual. You know, people, in fact, have become NIMBYs because of the constant disappointment. You know, you, when you say, we're coming here, we're growing, we're bringing shops, we're bringing offices, we're bringing housing, and so forth, people say, wait a minute, I'd rather have nature, even though you have a lot of nature. You say, I'd rather have, I'd rather have nature than what you bring me. But you say, but you need housing, you need shops, you need things. You say, no, actually, I'd rather leave it alone. And that is not irrational. You know, things have been getting worse. At least one person today spoke about being a little girl here and what a little girl could do and what a little girl can no longer do. Okay? Now, this city, in some ways, doesn't have to do anything. And that's too bad because it's a lot easier to actually work with emergency room patients. They shut up and they're grateful. But you're nowhere near emergency room condition. Okay? One of the things you have is you, you actually, in some ways, you skipped the last recession. You had one of the least, you know, as far as I understand it, you, you were one of the least affected places. Even your market, in fact, didn't affect you. In the great environmental meltdown that surrounds us all, it seems that actually the rising ocean won't get you. Like, wow, you know, I come from a place where it's already getting us. 
And furthermore, your energy is at one quarter the price of Seattle's energy. And your energy is clean, right? And you're applied with 4,000 PhDs in engineering that will save you anyway. <laughs> because you're gonna come up with all sorts of stuff locally to save you. And you have a better climate, although there's some question about that. Uh, you have a better climate, certainly, than the cool cities of Seattle, Portland, and uh, Vancouver. In fact, I was told, and I haven't verified this, that you're as good as Denver, which is one of the reasons people move to Denver, is that it's such a wonderful climate. You know, and there's a lot of evidence that this is, you know, a cool, clear place. Now, I'm told about the summer as well. But there's a, you have a lot going for you. But you also have a dissatisfaction, which we saw today. And it took very many, by the way, very few negative things were said today, but there were some negative ones. And uh, probably the most precise is we don't want big boxes. We don't want any more big boxes. We don't want any more chain restaurants, not a single one more. So apparently you have a full supply for the rest of your lives of everything. <laughs> But at the same time, there's something you don't have, which is actually a, a, a main street. You don't have a main street, and you don't have a main, you, don't, you apparently don't have anything that's much that stays open after 9 o'clock. You know, somebody sarcastically said that. And a lot of people are going home, and actually, to a great extent, the young people don't have as much to do as they should. The kids do. You drive them to the parks, the wonderful parks. You have good education for the kids. But there is a problem in the civic realm. You have essentially no pedestrian public space, none. So what we saw today and what interested me was not the details of flowers and fountains and water and, you know, laser, you know, laser art on the silos, you know, which, or, you know, very, the very good idea of commemorating the the, the, the aviators who learned to fly here, and many of which probably died, as you say. Cool ideas, no problem with that, okay? That's actually, all of that's easy. The, the difficulty is getting to a pedestrian-oriented, compact, mixed-use place when everything is against it. Everything's against it. And uh, the things that are against it are a completely rational system of suburban sprawl that takes cheap land and makes money off it. Okay, it's totally rational. You basically separate everything from everything else. All the houses are here, and all the rental apartments are here, and all the shops are here, and all the workplaces are here. And then we have all the money to build these beautiful, highly maintained roads, may I say, that you have. I mean, it's amazing how good your roads are. And everybody buys a car, which is expensive. And that is such a rational system that when we come up with ideas like, could we park half a block down and walk? Or could we actually have inexpensive space to incubate a regular person to start a business? People come up and say, but don't we have to make $15 a foot? You know, the banker I'm talking about. You know, and the people in the authority say, well, you have to park on the same site. You know, you have to park on the site. And uh, God knows. I mean, there's a litany of things that actually prevent it. So the first thing that we have to deal with, we more than you, is to, in fact, alter the regulations alter the regulations. And I had a very wonderful dinner with the mayor, the current mayor of Kennewick, uh, two and a half hours ago, I mean two and a half days ago, in which I think we're absolutely on the same, on the same page on that. You know, to get this done, it's going to be completely an open system. Things will be rethought from the beginning. And that's actually the pivotal decision that said, I'm going to stay, because I think this is going to happen. You know, when the mayor said, the mayor, was finishing my sentences and I was finishing his. We were absolutely on the same page. It was really good. And that really said, this is a very special condition. You know, that the mayor is behind it and he's going to get the regulators to do it. So what is against us? 
Well, it turns out that probably half the people in this city, and you know how the voting goes, really don't want anybody from Miami here doing anything. <laughs> and they don't want their taxes affected at all. And they're going to go after this. Right? And you know what I'm talking about. And I hope some of you are here. Because the problem with this afternoon's meeting is that there weren't enough people that, that represented that side. I wanted to hear them. Okay, I really wanted to hear them. Uh, so, we have, we heard Gary Black not only made the list, but he's going to make the list beautiful and rational and compelling tomorrow. He's going to work all night, apparently, and make the list even better. We can provide, we can deliver 90% of it, no problem. But we're going to present you with a, a, a kind of agonizing choice. There is the perfect one, the perfect place, that will take 25 to 30 years to do and probably require a subsidy, but perfect. Better than move over Portland, OK? Or we're, going to prov or we're going to provide the possible one. And the possible one is really good, too. But it will only take 10 to 15 years, and it is almost impossible to stop. And I want to describe what that's like, OK? The United States was colonized, the West was colonized. Just imagine the Mormons was colonized by 30 million people without a nickel, without a penny. They couldn't even afford covered wagons. They would come over in wheelbarrows. And the Mormons alone founded 934 towns, cities, and villages, including San Diego, in 50 years. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, 534, not 900, 534. And not one of them failed. It was an absolute, and these were penniless immigrants coming from, essentially from Northern Europe, coming across in debt and walking across the desert, and they would arrive and found cities, a dozen a year. And those cities became wealthy without subsidies. And some of them became so wealthy that they were able, out of the value of the real estate and the intelligence of the organizers, to create enough wealth that they were able to build, first of all, magnificent temples, and then magnificent opera houses, and then magnificent everything. They created wealth out of the earth because, they were so, because of their wits. Okay. We still know how to do that. Particularly, our firm has been fascinated by this. Ever since 2007, when everything melted down, and the the credit was withdrawn. We said, we've got to keep going. We can't just stop because $3 billion or $30 billion have evaporated. We've got to figure out how it used to be done. So we're going to propose two projects. We're going to propose one which is as the Mormons would have done it, which is successional. You start with one story. You fill it up. It's not mixed use on top. It's mixed use beside. It is mixed use, but the apartment's not above the shop. It's beside the shop so that you don't confuse the banker, so that you don't have a structural problem, so that you don't have the fire stair. There are all sorts of technical reasons that make that difficult. So we're going to give you two choices. We're going to give you the one that is absolutely the climax condition, something that you build, and you're going to want to put a preservation order from day one. It's so beautiful. It's so good. We'll never have to modify it. Right. And you can, there, there, are, you, there are projects that we've built quite a few. The, probably one of the closest is Santana Row in uh, south of San Francisco. You know, great four-story main streets, shops below, apartments on top, you know. And then there is the other kind, which is one and two and three stories, and it fills in very quickly. And you start having your streets, and it only costs $70 a square foot to build a commercial space, which means you can incubate your buildings. And in fact, because you spend so little on horizontal infrastructure, you can actually afford vertical infrastructure, i.e. your art center. Okay, because you spend less on the horizontal, you can immediately go vertical right, with it. 
And this does not prevent you 25 or 30 years from now from actually doing this successional project and gradually demolish it and gradually arriving at the three and four story town center, which is the climax condition. So you see what I'm saying? One is the organic 19th century one that actually is very, actually, I, I think you know exactly what you mean. I went to the, what's it called, the Reach Museum? Okay. Did you see the housing of the people who built the atomic bomb? Did you see what, how long it took them to build that stuff? It was like gods were there. I mean, it was so fast. And it's that attitude I'm talking about. And then it became something else, and then it became something else. It was successional. And what I'm saying is that the choice we're going to offer you, and this is real choice, real agonizing choice, are two, two at least two schemes, and you have to make that choice. Okay, and it's, it's, really, it's really going to be interesting, and we'll try to do the numbers. So, um, one way or the other, it's going to put you on the map. One way it's going to put you on the map because you're going to have a downtown to die for, although it might take 25 years, and you may have died before it happens. <laughs> okay, no question about that. And the other one is going to be fascinating because it really hasn't been done before. And I'm kind of biased towards a fascinating one that hasn't been done before because I want to see it. Okay, so that's, that's going to, that's, I can already tell what that's going to be like. Okay, so I'm going to show you where we are now. I, apparently no one has ever printed the 937. I can't get anybody in my office to print it. I can't get anybody to print the 937 page book. <laughs> so I can't show it to you. But the, anyway. So that was done. Now this is your place where three rivers meet. Uh, uh, somebody spoke, uh, there was at least one woman today that had a very sort of geological knowledge of what was happening in this place. And this is a really special place, geologically. Now, uh, to tell you how I feel about this, I'm actually interested in the geology of the next century. You know, what's going to happen to climate, et cetera. Apparently, you're going to do pretty well. This is going to be one of the winners in the disastrous 21st century. It's pretty interesting, actually. You know, and not everybody's going to be a winner, but you're going to be a winner, which means you probably will continue growing. You know, you will be, you might even get some people from Miami here. But uh, you have your river, you have the three cities, you know the history very well. Uh, you have a very strong market. Uh, in fact, I didn't emphasize this enough. You're educating your kids beautifully. You have good schools. You're feeding them. You're educating them, you're bringing up right, and then you're losing them. So you and your taxpayers and your money is being spent and it's being harvested by Seattle and San Francisco and Portland, who are not doing such a good job with their own kids, actually. But just think of it that way. You're investing and investing with your taxes and taxes and you're losing the kids because there's not enough to do. There isn't a nightlife. And, you know, kids are desperate for that. You know, sometimes I don't know whether I should bring up things that are so common now, but the generation growing up now is not at all seduced by suburban life. They adore cities, they are not intrigued by cars, and besides they don't have any money anyway to buy them. And, but they're very different from my own generation that was fascinated by cars. And my mother's generation who was fascinated by suburbs, they're really different. And they are uh, living in all the urban places. So to keep them, you have to move to some extent there in that direction. And by the way, the old folk, I hesitate to be explicit about it, but some of us can't drive forever, you know. You know, we're going to need a place where we can walk to our daily needs because that's how it goes. And if there isn't a place you can walk to your daily needs, you're going to go end up in a little cafeteria in a you know, hideously expensive retirement community where they take you they feed you in the cafeteria and take you with the, the little bus to the mall. But if you have a walkable neighborhood, you can walk a lot longer than you can drive. You have a place that will be a real place. Okay, so, and these are the two big, they're the two largest generations ever. The millennials and the boomers are the two largest generation. And what do they want? They want the kind of, uh, the kind of urbanism that we saw being presented today. Exactly is what you want. So you have a kind of blessed place. It's an agricultural hinterland, uh, which is good enough for tourism, and uh, a river, 
which is also good enough for tourism. By the way, not a single man-made thing is good enough for tourism, not one. You cannot have a single man-made thing here that you can put in a poster and get somebody to come here, which is kind of scary, but we'll get there. The second thing is that there's a field perfectly located in a relatively dense area that has come up for redevelopment. And that field, bless the Lord, has already completely ruined nature. So we don't have to destroy any nature to make it. <laughs> and that's a blessing because most greenfield development, you have to destroy nature. And you have to study to see if any Indians are buried there, you have to study to see all sorts of things. And this one can move so fast. We can move really into this very quickly because of that. And there's no controversy. And in fact, if you care about nature and you want to do something about it, being able to walk instead of drive is an enormous contribution you know, to having a clean atmosphere. So that's the way you deal with nature when you're building a city, is not by not trampling on it. You deal with it because you are actually building where already you should build and not you know, out in the suburbs trampling on it. So it's a wonderful site and that's a huge, uh, that's one of the reasons that, that I stayed here. Then you have an airfield which is actually, I don't know how big you think it is, but it's huge. It's really huge and we did some scale comparisons. Here it is in yellow and actually it's a mile long. It's actually two neighborhoods, two quarter mile pedestrian sheds like that. And there it is. Now, there's a couple of things that I'm going to be realistic about. Okay. One of them is that this stuff here is not going to go away for 15 or 20 years. I bet you were going to say a long time. No, it doesn't last that long. Particularly if we do something that has very high real estate value, this has very low real estate value. It gets demolished. Think of everything that you see here is first generation building. Butler buildings like this, no one's going to, no preservation order. But what it, they need to redevelop is actually to have something of such value and intensity and desirability here that it makes no sense to keep this stuff. So one of the things we're going to do is we're going to trample across some, uh, maybe something that sounds unusual to you, we're going to design the whole thing. In other words, what's there now doesn't exist for me. That's the present. I'm thinking of the future. I'm thinking 25 years out. Okay, this is 25 years out. None of this stuff will make sense. So right from the beginning, we're going to connect and connect and connect and connect and assume that the whole thing is going to become a pretty marvelous town center. Okay? So although we only have the center to work with, we consider the line to be arbitrary. Okay? And all of this, don't, this huge super block will become available. Look at the parking. It's astounding. All that gray stuff is parking. Okay, so just by, by scale comparison, I think most of you know Seattle. I spent some time there. Right here, I believe it is right here, right, Michael? Here? Okay, okay, here. Okay, you know Pike Place Market, right? Everybody knows it. It's a pretty big place. You know, it's got a lot going, a lot going. You can easily spend, a, I spent a whole Sunday morning there, never got bored. That Pike Place Market, the entire thing fits in one tip of this. That's the scale that we're talking about. I spent all weekend in Seattle. This is one of these, is Fifth, is Fifth Street. I spent all week here. I never left this area, never. That was the whole universe, it's all I needed. You know, and it all fits in this same scale. And here's even more astonishing. Okay, this is the airfield, and this is a photograph of Portland, which is, and this, these are called, the, what I call the park blocks of Portland. Okay, this, these, are, these are two slide, two aerial photographs put together. So a huge amount, an enormous amount, all the good parts of Portland fit here, just in the airfield. And if you take the whole thing together, just look at the scale of this thing. Look at how much of Portland, this is only a portion of our site, and look at how much of Portland fits. So, you know, the ability to be ambitious is there. But there's one thing I, that you will see, you will see uh, that I'll show you later. 
Portland, a lot of the really cool stuff is first generation one and two stories. It's exactly what I'm talking about, and there's nothing wrong with it. Yeah, of course, there's the Pearl District and the new high rises, but the coolest areas are first generation, 1870, walk up apartments, little houses, and inexpensive shops. And that's where all the cool things are happening. So if we can all agree that this is a model to be aspired to, and by the way, I'm rather biased towards this one. I think it's, I think it's an enormously gentler and friendlier urbanism than, uh, than Seattle. I was kind of shocked. I thought, I thought that Seattle looked like, felt like Manhattan on hills, frankly. I mean, it was a big, tough place, and the traffic never stopped. And Portland is a gentler place, and I think it's a more realistic model. Okay, so this is what we did. This is the airfield, and you will see that one end has a plaza that probably has the shops, because this is where the traffic is, and there's a series of squares of different sizes and boulevards and squares and boulevards and squares and boulevards and squares of different sizes, and each of these are blocks. And these are the pink build, the pink are the new buildings, and in the white in the middle are the cars parked. So you don't see them, just like many of you were smart enough to ask for. And then there's an axis that shoots in this direction past the convention center, which is here, right or here, and the mall and everything else, and reaches deep, deep to the corner of the enormous super block, you see. And a lot of these things, actually, this red line is the outline of the site but you can see how much activity, how much we are connecting, et cetera, to the existing system. This is the 25-year plan. I think this is conceived to be two, three, and four-story, this. This is the one that was gonna knock their socks off, and we're gonna fully develop it, and we're gonna price it, et cetera. Now, here's the downside of it. You see that little building there? Let's say, not even from here to here, let's say this little, see that little corner building? That one there, at four stories is $15 million. It's a lot of money. Okay, so let's say you get somebody to build a $15 million building. You have shops on the first floor. You have dozens of apartments on top. What do you have after four years? One corner building. Very photogenic. Oh, yes. I'm very hopeful. Well, if you actually do successional urbanism, which is you bring it down to something which is, uh, as I said, which is um, inaugural, the inaugural condition. You know, the, you can actually get, you can fill this a lot faster. Okay, so this is a beautiful plan. I, th I, I didn't do it. Michael did it with Lawrence and Tom Lowe. You know, Tom Lowe from our office. And there's very little that I can say to improve this plan. We're just going to develop it further. And here you can see some sketches. Look at this. Look at this magnificent, magnificent urbanism. This, this thing that you see here is one of these. So you have magnificent urbanism, et cetera, okay? And then there's this other condition, okay? This is the airfield, and you have that. This pavement there. That pavement is actually very exciting because that pavement are, is footings. It's footings and roads. You already have footings and roads. You know, if this were 1943, I could just call up and said, could I get some carpenters out there and start building buildings? Because we don't even have to pour footings. And we got the roads and the trucks can get on it. So here we have two models, right? You know, we have a complete existential choice right from the beginning. We either work with the existing, which means you can start very, very quickly and very, very inexpensively, right? Or, which by the way is absolutely what Brigham Young would have done if he knew what asphalt was, you know? That's the kind of pragmatic thinking. Or do we do this one? Very tough choice. OK, so there we are. That's the, that's, the, uh, that's, the, that's the theme of the party for the next week. You know? And we're going to try to work both of these things out. Uh, there are a lot of ingredients here. I met somebody from Bechtel. Uh, who actually researches energy and who researches uh, green building and standards and regulations. Uh, I basically said, uh, if we can interest you, I'm not going to bore you with 
unambitious projects. But if we happen to stumble across an ambitious project, will you help us? And he says, yes, we have, we have funding to have people participate, you know, real engineers to come in and help you do this. You know, mutual, mutual benefit. You know, this is a very advanced project. I do want to hook onto them. Uh, I asked whether their um, employees would live here. Uh, and uh, they said, he said, well, uh, it's, it's more distant than some of the housing they get, but if there's a bus, they would. You know, the way that people who work for Microsoft and Apple and so forth get a bus to go there. So that's the, that's the beginning of that, uh, of that conversation that we have with them. And then uh, today, I mean, I think there's a developer that walked in. What's the name of that fellow that wears short pants in winter? Do you know him? Is he here? Yes, he is. He's right there. OK. Well, uh, we didn't have enough developers today. When in the meeting that happened today, there was, a, uh, there was very little discussion on the market, very little discussion on costs, who's going to pay for, for what, et cetera. Let me say something about the market. Because land is so cheap, you can get more for less not here. Here, you're going to get, you're going to, the kind of place that's going to happen here is you're going to consider it a blessing to have a smaller unit without a yard for which you pay more than a larger unit with a yard. It's, it's a, it seems to be a tough sell, but it's a tough sell for some people. The people who want more for their money, you can't beat suburban sprawl, particularly because the land is so cheap here. But those who actually don't want to have a larger unit for the hell of it, but want to actually have cafes and squares and movies, in other words, who, for whom the public realm is their living room, are going to come here. So I expect that about usually between a third and a half of the people of any Amer American place are looking for this. Okay? But we didn't have developers willing to basically take the risk. You know, they're going to be taking, he said, we're going to say, take this land, we're not going to, we're going to give it to you very inexpensively because you're pioneering, but you're going to take a risk. You're going to write a five to $10 million check on a completely unknown building type that there's no evidence has ever sold here before, none. Okay, so I think we have to respect the fact that it's pretty scary what developers do. And they weren't here present today, so one of our jobs is to, is to make sure that, that it happens. The other job, and I don't know how this is going to be, is if this is treated as a kind of uh, a piggy bank, you know, in which, you know, it's a valuable piece of land. If this is a piggy bank in which funds are continually extracted for, let's say, the port operations, there'll be plenty for the port later, but early, it needs to be reinvested. And that's something we haven't negotiated. You know, we, we don't know how that really works. But I think there's the expectation that this is going to be a very good thing financially for the port. And we don't know, we don't, we, I really don't have a grip on that. Uh, certainly, it's wonderful that the interest clock isn't ticking. We can actually do it right because somebody hasn't paid $80 million for this piece of land and the interest clock is ticking, so we have to carve it up and sell to five developers. And by the way, I have uh, some writing that has come in that the premise is that it's going to be sold to three or four developers, you know. Go in, cut it up, sell it. That's what happens in conventional development when the clock is ticking. In this one, the clock isn't ticking. We can actually get it right. And it's one of the really, one of the main reasons I think this is going to come out right, you know. If we do not put this in debt, we, the idiot planners and the idiot infrastructure engineers, don't put the port in debt, this can go very smoothly. But if we start having ideas in which it's millions and millions and millions of dollars before the first lot is sold, then it's going to be a much more conventional project. And one of the reasons I want to keep the, dry, the runway is I don't want to pay for tearing it up. Tearing it up, carting it up, and then putting more pavement in, I don't think that's too brilliant. So that's one of the, that's one of the I think, one of the issues that we have to deal with. By the way, I don't think that, uh, my handlers in the port have heard any, you know, one of the things about charrettes is you hear it in real time. They hear it when you hear it. <laughs> so, and so do the elected officials, but that's what, it's, but that's what it's like. It's really kind of scary. It's like you're, you're skating on the precipice because you have to respond real time. 
Okay, so that's, that's all I know about this. Uh, I do know, actually I told you a lot, I do know it's gonna come out as two choices. And unlike slight variations, we normally have slight variations. Sir, would you like it with mayonnaise or mustard? But you're getting the hot dog. Here it's different. It's like really different. It's the vegetarian or the big chunk of beef. So, you know, it's a tough call because one is hardier, but it can kill you. <laughs>